Oh, CEO? CEO. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about modality in Cherokee, but before starting to present this topic, which is much uh, less entertaining than the first uh, presentation, I just wanted to share with you which were my goals uh, when I came here to Colen. And well, basically, I came here just to explore. I'm pretty new to the field, to the domain of uh, field linguistics, and it was something that I had always wanted to do, and it was a way of testing and seeing if I like it and maybe do it in the future. And I completely fell in love with it. So <laughs> I think I, I'd like to continue with it, and so that was for me the most important output that I got from this practice. So not. So specifically, what I'm going to talk about is pretty technical, but the personal experience and maybe some goals for the future. So before starting to focus on modality, which is, I only did like one week and a half ago, I was working with the topic of word creation. I was very interested in how uh, the Cherokee language uh, names new objects. So I was torturing Georgia and Ida <laughs> and asking them, so how would you say computer or social network or microscope and all these kind of uh, words which are pretty technical in some ways and which are not used in, uh, in everyday life. But then uh, Brad suggested models as a topic because he said that this has, this has not been studied very much and that we could maybe make a contribution if we focused on LCD models and different uh, aspects of modality in Turkey. So I thought it was a good uh, idea and I decided to concentrate on modality. So uh, the first thing that I would like to do is to define what I mean by modality in this presentation. So I focus basically on situational modality and not epistemic modality. So by uh, situational modality, I refer to possibility and necessity notions applied to situations and not to propositions. So in this, um, in this work, what I include are notions like ability to do things, uh, permission, and general possibility. And by this I mean, uh, like when we use the verb can in English without implying that there is a personal ability involved or that there is an external authority to offer us the person to the action. Then regarding necessity, I refer to obligation and prohibition. And then I was also dealing with the uh, desideratives, so wishes. And I was trying to elicit desideratives which refer to more or less hypothetical situations. Uh, there was an evolution in my work regarding the methodology. So I was pretty naive in this field, and I started to ask uh, just translation of sentences. It was pretty difficult to know exactly what I was getting from a semantic point of view. So I kind of evolved and got, was giving more and more context to Ida and Georgia to know what I meant uh, exactly uh, with the sentences that I gave them. So for instance, in order to get the ability versus the possibility, uh, in a sentence like, I cannot read, I would tell them, well, I cannot read, the reason being that I never learned, or the reason being that it's too dark in here. And like that, it started to work better. And then, um, well, the second one, I just started to do it like two days ago, and Gretchen actually gave me this advice, maybe you should try to play with words and try to produce sentences in Cherokee, and test how the verbs and the model, model markers decay. So I was trying to build some sentences and then I go to Georgia and Alba and say, oh, is, is it okay or is it not okay to find if the sentences were grammatical or not? And it worked pretty well. So, yeah. Uh, so for instance, I found out that you cannot say tahla to mean uh, you must not or you have to not do something. So this is something that puzzled me and I still haven't found the Cherokee uh, corresponding expression. And then something that I used also were prompts. Like for instance, the certain stories that Gretchen uh, told us about. And then I used also traffic signs. And both were very useful for eliciting the auntie models. So I would present the Georgia and Ida these traffic signs and I would tell them, how would you say 
lines are not permitted here, or you're not allowed to pass here, and stuff like that, and it worked pretty well. So that were two methodologies that I would recommend. So regarding the tools that I used, I realized pretty quickly that it would be useful to have a corpus of uh, single sentences with corresponding audio files. So I used Audacity to segment the files and then I labeled them and ex exported them into WAV files that I could then link to the transcriptions in uh, Flex. So I ended up having a corpus in Flex with different types of models. So basically I had a, a different text for every type of model. I had one for desiderities, one for possibility and ability, and one, and one for genetics. And in each one of the files I would have the transcriptions and then the link to the audio files so that we could check together with the class whether the transcription was okay or not. I just realized that it might have been more uh, clever to just have one text and use the field notes or tags in flex to annotate with a semantic category because then you can actually filter the examples by semantic category. But maybe I will do that in the future. So now I would just like to present some examples of the different uh, context that I tried to elicit. This is very informal, it's very preliminary, and I just wanted to identify the actual uh, words that were used to express the different uh, model concepts. The first one, for ability, there is actually a verb that uh, indicates whether someone can do, knows how to do something. So the verb is gataha, which is followed by the verb in infinity with the corresponding uh, Prefix. So this is actually you saw Joseph's uh, presentation. You will recognize now the uh, personal prefixes. So we have G and A for the first person singular. They are actually different because wait, it's second. It's B and yeah. So it's the second one is B and the first one is set A. So Joseph was showing the two sets of prefixes, and while well, some verbs take. Uh, set A prefixes and some other takes set B. And so here you can see that the verb know, to, know how to takes a set A uh, prefix. Whereas in the second case for swim, we have the first B prefix. And this is why, this is because actually uh, all the infinitives take uh, set B prefixes. So here, I mean, this complements a little bit Gretchen's and Joseph's presentation. You can see that the uh, it's a polysynthetic language, so it can get very complicated at the verbal level. Um, you can see here also, uh, you have the negative example for the ability sentence. You can see that for a negative, uh, the la particle and the the uh, focus particle are used at the beginning of the sentence. And then we also have an irrealis prefix, which comes before the personal prefix and attaches to the verb. This is something that we find in negation. And then we have the, uh, the verb uh, in infinitive with a personal uh, prefix again. And then for the inter interrogative sentence, we just have yes, which marks uh, that it's an interrogative. For permission, uh, there were actually two uh, markers. So the first one is uh, comes from elibu, which is an adverb, which can mean possibly. And we find it in a short form in the examples and with the the particle which is the focus. So we find eluda, which means can. In this case, you can. And we know that this is that is the second person plural because we have a prefix in the verb that attaches. <coughs> we also have another, uh, a, another marker for permission, which is a verb, and which is adjuvoid. So we have actually uh, a, a particle, which is not a verb, and then a verbal marker for, for permission. For possibility, we find again a, so the possibly marker. Uh, but it's semantically different from the previous example, because whereas in the previous example, there was someone uh, authorizing the action. In this case, there is no authority uh, authorizing the person to do the action or ability, personal ability involved. So here, uh, we're just referring to I can walk. It's something that I can do. It doesn't uh, necessarily mean I know how to. It's something that is just possible. 
And in the negative sentence here, you can see that uh, I can't read refers to a context where maybe it's physically impossible, or so it's different from saying I can read, meaning I know how to read. For aggregation, we have another marker, which is not a verb, which is uh, the particle assay, which stays usually the focus particle also, so it usually appears as assay And um, we find then also the personal prefixes attached to the verb. So for instance, in the first case, you can see I have to go to town, at Aseda, I have, I have to, and then the Aduha, which is town, and Awinasi, go to, in the infinitive form. So this is why it takes the uh, prefix of set B. And then we have the same particle with the negative before to indicate the permission not to do something. That is to say, the lack of obligation. So, don't have to. In this case, uh, we have the example of you don't have to wash the dishes. So, we see that again, we have the same particle, asset preceded by the negative, and then the verb with the distributive uh, prefix D, which refers to the dishes, which are plural, and then uh, the J, which refers to the person, the second B uh, prefix. For prohibition, we have again two forms. We have the particle Ellie, which appears, uh, which literally would mean I cannot, but it, it actually appeared when I was trying to elicit I am not allowed to. And then we have the negative of the verb as what. So we have the plus negative particle plus the irregular suffix prefix which uh, attaches to as what to the verb. For this virtues, the I, I elicited three different structures. So the first one is the verb to want to, this aduliha. And here you can see again how the prefix is attached to the stem of the verb. And then uh, how the irrealis prefix ye attaches in the negative uh, clause. And then it was very interesting because this same uh, prefix, which is used in the negative sentence, is used to indicate a less probable situation or a more hypothetical situation meaning I would like to. So in this case, we would have first the irrealis, then the personal prefix, and then the verb in infinitive with the personal prefix again. And the translation would be, I would like to do something. But I'm kind of dreaming, because it's very hypothetical. And something very interesting that uh, derived from the other situations is the yoseta, which is apparently not something very common, because we find uh, the uh, ye uh, prefix again, which is the realis, attaching to an adjective, which is means good, which is osa. And so this is something that we should need to explore more and try to elicit more sentences, because apparently, well, Brad said it was not something very common. So it was very interesting. And it looks like it's an impersonal with the dirt. So it would be nice to do something. This is a summary of the all the markers that were elicited, so classified semantically uh, into these three domains, possibility, uh, necessity, and then the desideratives that we're talking about. So in possibility, we can see that for ability, there is a verb, actually, which is know how to, or can, which is gaftaha. Then for permission, we find the particle eli, which is a short version of eli good, the upper. We find also a verbal marker, which is asko. And then for the negative permission, that is to say the permission not to do something, we have the negation of the geontic particle acid with the da, which is the focus. So plata acid. Then for general possibility, where no uh, personal ability or external authority is required, we find again the any particle. For obligation, we have another marker which is not verbal, which is acid. And then for prohibition, we have a verbal mar marker with a particle, which is la, the negative particle, plus the realist prefix. So here we have this realist. And then for the desiderative, we find a um, verbal marker, which can be less hypothetical if it comes without the irrealist prefix, and then more hypothetical if it comes with the, with the e prefix. And then finally, the impersonal that we identified and that we should analyze further to see in which context it appears. So it was, 
it was something that actually surprised me because uh, if we think that Cherokee is a polysynthetic language, we actually would expect there to be uh, prefixes that would attach to the, to the verb to mark modality, but actually we didn't identify so many prefixes. So the only one that appeared was the E, the Uranalis, which is not exclusively modal. So typologically, we could say that um, Cherokee belongs to the group of languages which can mark modality with verbal constructions, not, and not really with affixes on verbs. And so you can see that it's actually the mainstream. So you have over 150 languages that can mark possibility with verbal constructions, where you have uh, only very few languages that use only other kinds of markers, and a little bit over 60 languages that mark it with affixes. So we could say that it looks like it's mainstream. So this uh, preliminary analysis actually um, opens up a lot of issues to explore. So the first thing is to analyze more deeply what is the actual use and the pragmatics of the model. So that in, in the same way that we see that in English a lot of times can is used instead of may, this may be one of the reasons why Eligus appear both for possibility and permission. So we, would analyze it, we should analyze it uh, in more specific context in order to find out if there is an exclusive form for permission, like may. Then I was enabled to elicit uh, two different markers for should and must. So I was only able to elicit asset, which apparently is only must, but I wasn't able to find any other structure which indicated a less strong obligation. Then uh, it would be interesting to analyze the scope of negation in models also because as I told you before, um, a construction like a Sedahla is not grammatical. So uh, we should analyze how the concept of having to not do something or uh, a mass not do something is expressed in Cherokee. Then we uh, saw as well this impersonal construction for the severities, which takes the realities plus an objective to see uh, what is the actual context of appearance of this particle. And then something that I only uh, slightly analyze is the behavior of different wall markers and subordinate clauses. I didn't really have time to go and uh, take uh, examples of these cases, but I think it would be interesting to study them more deeply. So, what though? This is all that I have to share with you about models. And, and yeah, I think that the corpus that was built uh, will be used by other researchers and I hope to be able to put that online or to share it with other people because it's already classified more or less. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
because if you don't know what, where you can use these words, you're not going to be able to use them correctly. You're not going to be able to use them um, the way they're supposed to be used. So let's look um, at a few words in Cherokee. So kilo is often translated as someone or somebody. Um, it can also mean who in certain contexts. Um, and you know, so far things are looking pretty good. I mentioned when I got here earlier that there are these these endings and they don't seem to do that much. So we're just going to call all of these kilo. Um, if you see someone tell me who is it, you could say it's somebody um, or to somebody. And you can also use it um, in NPI-like context. You know, don't make so much noise. Somebody is sleeping. And you can say that whether or not you know that it's a particular person that's sleeping or if it's just, you know, there must be somebody sleeping because we're in a hotel and it's late at night uh, and I'm sure that somebody's in bed by now. Um, and you can also use it in things like questions, did somebody tell you, or did anybody tell you. And you can also use it in a negative context, plata, kilo, um, and so on. I don't believe that anybody knows. So there's a variety of different ways you can use kilo. This looks very straightforward. Hey, maybe everything is just kilo, uh, and that would be really easy. Uh, and then this, there are a few others, and then the, the corresponding, um, the corresponding indefinite two kilo for things that aren't people um, is goose or gohusti, um, which are just phonological variations of each other. Um, so you can say something like, I'm too tired to do anything, or about three or four days later he was noticing something. So this could mean something like anything or something as well. Um, and then we also have ilakha, uh, which means something like somewhere, uh, last sentence for comedic value, um, we all can all agree that it's pretty true that Lawrence is really hot this, this time of year. Um, and uh, so one interesting thing that I'm first noticing about these is oftentimes when you see words, uh, indefinite words in languages like English, they're often somewhat, somewhat related to each other. Not always, but often related to each other. So you have something and anything and they both have that thing in there. These words do not appear related to each other. We had kilo, we had hus, Gohusti, and we had Ilafla, and they barely even have any letters in common at all that I could find. So it looks like they're very distinct uh, lexical items, which itself is kind of interesting. And now we get into the really crazy part, um, <laughs> which is so here we were doing pretty well with anywhere, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, some, I don't know anything, something like that. Um, now we start talking about you can pick um, anything, or pick anyone. We get this new construction. We get several new constructions. Um, the first of these is something that looks like gawada used to used to um, but the gawada may or may not be part of that. Um, and this comes up in contexts like you can pick anybody um, or choose anyone if you're giving someone a command. You know, you, you need someone to be your partner for this this project or something like that choose anybody. You can't have everybody be your partner because then you wouldn't be partners, you should only working in a group. Um, so that's something like pick anybody. Um, there's also uh, when there's the, which looks like it might be related, you can see this oos kind of in the middle there, and there might also be an oos in the middle there. So there might be some sort of relation between these. There might not be. Um, but there looks like there's something going on that's some sort of relation between them. Um, and this can be used in, when you're talking about um, some constructions that aren't terribly well lexicalized in English, um, but they look but when they're talking about something, you don't particularly care um, what it is or what what the result is. So if you want to say something like Mary sleeps just anywhere, um, meaning she doesn't mind where she sleeps, you know, she's an easy guest to have over, she'll just sleep on the floor, um, then you can, <laughs> you know, I, you, you can talk about you can talk about it in that type of context. If you want to say it doesn't matter how somebody does something, you can say, you know, do it any old way, when you uh, um, Or if you, you know, just need someone to mow your lawn, but you don't care if he does a terrible job, you can say, just go pick any old man. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, and then there's this other one that looks completely different and also means some very, also seems to mean some very similar things. Um, but there's probably a meaning difference that I'm just not very well aware of here. Um, so this construction, they got on. Um, you can say, don't just pick anyone, um, which if there was the, 
this is kind of the a negative equivalent to, to this sentence, but they don't look morphologically related. Uh, and so you can say, don't just pick anybody, you know, make sure you pick whoever is very important. You can also use it in kind of a general statement, like every dog eats, any dog eats. Um, or somebody who is rather shy, who only likes to talk to people he knows, you can say, he doesn't want to talk to, he doesn't talk to just, he won't talk to just anybody, he only talks to his family or something like that. Um, and it looks like this is probably related to Migalta uh, at the bottom, which you can see means everyone or all, something like that. But I'm not sure, and so, so Migalta could just have this the particle that we've been seeing a lot, um, and which means there's probably some other type of particle on Migalta, um, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So, this is, this is why I'm going to keep working Turkey. Um, <laughs> so, and then there's also this other word, um, which goes plesti nigalstiha. Um, so you can also say don't just pick anyone. So notice that these examples look very similar to each other. Don't just pick anyone. Don't pick just anyone. But in this case, nigalstiha specifically implies that the thing you're talking about is really of low quality. It's it's crap. It's inferior. It's not something that is is very is very important or is very good. Uh, whereas niga uh, niga doesn't imply that. It just says you, know, you can pick anyone, but it might it might turn out to be good. In this case, it, it probably really isn't. Um, so, in this case, you can say so. For example, Mary picked any old book. Um, I'm pronouncing that wrongly. I'm sure I am. Uh, and so, and this is the type of context where Mary just kind of went to the bookshelf, grabbed the first book she saw, and used it as a doorstop. And she didn't care what the content of the book was. She just thought. You know, this is something. I just need to use this for its weight, not for its content. So it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, and then again, you see the parallel to Mary. In this case, Mary sleeps just anywhere. She's a convenient house guest. It doesn't matter if she sleeps on the floor or something like that. In this case, Mary is really sleeping in places that are not places you're supposed to sleep. This is something that <laughs> you know she's falling asleep. You know, standing up and like you know. In, in like not places where you're like not, not intending on doing so. So that's much more of a negative association than making with that word. Um, so there seem to be some differences here. I'm not sure what all of them are. It's compounded by the problem that in English there it's really bad to translate all of these because English doesn't have very good fixed expressions assigned to a lot of these different meanings. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested in looking at is trying to figure out what are some contexts that are really good to try and, to try and dis differentiate between what kinds of meanings are possible, what kind of meanings are being implied by different types of sentences. Um, but at the moment, it's still very much open. Um, and that's, that's it. I was told many years ago when I was learning how to do sweat lodges that it's not an endurance contest, neither is this. So please, stand up, stretch. You don't have to wriggle around your seat. You can go ahead and move. It's okay. Okay, I 